this cold morning of July. <laughs> Don't worry, I, I already adjusted the AC. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for bringing us here this morning, and we pray now for your assistance on the uh, study of your word, the doctrine of assurance of salvation. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we are going to continue the doctrine of assurance of salvation, that's chapter 18 in the Confession of Faith. We already uh, studied the first two paragraphs last week. So this morning we are going to see the next two paragraphs and finish the chapter. So what can I do if I don't have assurance of salvation? The short answer to that is since it is possible to be an heir of salvation without having assurance of it. The believer must work on making his calling and election sure in order to obtain and preserve this assurance. That's the short answer. Uh, so the accent, absence of assurance of salvation can be uh, explained by different reasons. Maybe uh, somebody has a shallow understanding of the gospel. And... Uh, and maybe a person who believes in doctrinal errors, doesn't understand very well salvation, may not be sure of his salvation. Um, others have a constant a struggle with sin or unbelief, and that leads them not to have a uh, assurance of salvation. Of course, everybody has a struggle against sin, and everybody has struggle against the flesh and all that but for some people that it leads them to doubt their salvation and maybe all of us at some point in life have had the same kind of doubt about our salvation or maybe you are not using the means of grace as you should so the question that we have then this morning is this is there something that i can do if I don't have that assurance of salvation, what can I do? And we have the answer on paragraph 3 in the confession, which I am going to read. This infallible assurance does not belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long in conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it, yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of means, attain thereunto, and therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure that thereby his heart may be enlarged and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper, proper fruits of this assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness. So the first thing that the confession tells us here is that assurance of faith does not belong to the essence of faith. It does not belong to the essence of faith. Which means that just because you are saved doesn't mean that necessarily you are going to have assurance of salvation. And it is possible to be saved and not be sure of your salvation. Those assurance of salvation and salvation are two different things. It is possible to have one without having the other. In the same way that it is possible to have a good health and believe that you are sick right to be a hypochondria it is possible it is possible also to be a spiritual hypochondria to be in good health spiritually and believe that you are sick and that you are dying and that you're going to hell <clears throat> why why is that well because salvation is an objective state 
that we obtain by faith, it is not a subjected feeling that one has in his heart. Salvation is something objective, an objective fact that does not depend on feelings, on what you think. It's like having, for example, sometimes I have my glasses, you know, and I'm, I'm reading like that, and then I put them like that. And then I'm looking for my glasses, you know, and I can't find them. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know what? That's when I went to Publix, I left them on the counter, and I, they are there, and all the time I have them here. You know, that's the objective fact. I have them here. It doesn't depend on what I think. So the same thing with salvation. It is, it is an objective thing. And your feelings have nothing to do with whether you are saved or not. What you think uh, doesn't have anything to do with that. So then the confession says that a believer may wait for a long time. And perhaps go through many conflicts and difficulties before obtaining the assurance of salvation. And I'm even add to that, a person may even die without even being sure of his salvation. So, um, therefore, it is important, very important, to make this, this distinction between assurance and salvation. And that may be the first step uh, for those who struggle with assurance to have this distinction in his head that salvation does not depend on how you feel, on what you feel, on, or how you feel inside. And if you don't understand that distinction, if you don't understand the fact that assurance does not belong to the essence of faith, uh, then probably, probably you are going to focus your attention on the wrong things. You're going to focus your attention on your feelings, your beliefs, and your thoughts. But the scripture tells you that you should focus your attention on Jesus Christ, on his work on the cross. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, we read, looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Consider Jesus, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. So it's very important to make that distinction. Salvation is one thing. It is an objective thing. Assurance is subjective. It, how I feel, how, what I think. And uh, it is important then to have our minds and our eyes set on Jesus. And uh, the fact that salvation is something that depends on the work that he did on the cross. <clears throat> So the next thing that the authors of the confession want, want us to pay attention to is the means of grace. The means of grace. They say, yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of means, attend thereunto. So they, they say, you, do you want to have assurance of salvation? Well, you have the means of grace. The means of grace. But first, uh, they say that you don't need an extraordinary revelation. Now, why do they say that? Why do they say, why did they feel that they had to include that there? Well, it is because of the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent, uh, which was a council of the Roman Catholic Church where they got together for almost 20 years. They got together to put together all these uh, doctrines against the Reformation movement, to define their, their doctrine in such a way that, you know, to um, combat what they call the errors of the Reformation movement. And in session chapter 6, chapter 12, the Council of Trent, they say, no one, moreover, so long as he lives this mortal life, ought in regard 
to the sacred mystery of divine predestination so far presumed as to the state which with absolute certainty that he is among the number of the predestined so they're saying nobody can know if you have been elected or not as if it were true that the one justified either cannot sin anymore or if he does sin that he ought to promise himself an assured repentance for except by a special revelation he cannot be known whom God has chosen to himself that's what they say the only way that you can know for sure if you are truly saved is by special revelation from God then in canon 16 is the canons in the uh, council of Trent is you know when they say if somebody believes this let him be anathema so they say if anyone says that he will for certain with an absolute and infallible certainty have that great gift of perseverance even to the end unless he shall have learned this by special revelation let him be anathema so they, they are saying the only way that you can have assurance of salvation assurance that you are going to persevere to the end is by special revelation if you don't have special revelation then you are accursed if you say so if you say that you are saved so the confession then is responding to that you don't need a special revelation uh, an angel doesn't have to appear to you you don't have to have a dream uh, a vision from heaven nothing like that what do you have to do well apply yourself to the good use of the means of grace that's what they say apply yourself to the good use of the means of grace now what are the means of grace well God has given us certain means for us to grow in faith to grow in hope uh, that doesn't mean that all who use the means of grace are going to automatically have the assurance of salvation but what it means is that it's not it is not possible to have assurance of salvation if you don't use the means of grace so the means are number one the word of god the word of god and we read for example in romans 15 4 for whatever things were written aforetime in the scriptures of course were written for our learning that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we may have hope now hope when you read the word hope in the scriptures it doesn't mean that you're going to cross your fingers and, and wait for the best to happen that may or may not happen no that's not what it means hope in the bible means assurance concerning something that is still in the future it is certainty of something that is still future, that has not happened yet. That's what hope means. <clears throat> then in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, we read, Now to him that is, that, that is of power, that is powerful, to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read now that from the ESV because I like it better. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. God is able to help you, but how? Through the preaching of Jesus Christ, through the word. Right? Whether you come here to listen to the word or read it in your house. God is helping you. God is strengthening you. God is giving you that, that strength, that confidence that you need through the reading of the word. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you shall both save yourself and them that hear you. Now, here the word save doesn't mean, you know, to justify you. It means to save you from, from many things. Save you from, from doctrinal error, such as not having assurance of salvation, which it is, uh, to a certain degree, it is a, it is a doctrinal error. <clears throat> so, he says, you know, Pay attention to the doctrine. Continue in the doctrine. Continue teaching uh, uh, the people of the church. Because when you do that, you are going to. They are going to grow stronger in the faith, and and they are going to have. Perhaps you're going to help them have this assurance of salvation that they need through the preachings, through the teaching of the doctrine of the gospel. Then the uh, second means of grace is prayer. 
prayer. It is also a means of grace because it moves us closer to God. You are never closer to God than when you are praying because, you know, you retract your mind from everything else and you go to the presence of the Lord in prayer. And um, one of the effects of that, of praying, you know, is assurance of salvation. You're going to feel closer to God. You're going to feel in communion with God. And probably by much prayer, then you're going to attain that assurance of salvation that you need. <clears throat> but also, it is possible to pray specifically for more faith and for assurance of salvation. And we have some examples in the Bible, we have some examples for, uh, like in Psalms 69, verse 13, and it says there, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation, in the certainty of your salvation, hear me, O Lord. Then in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, And straightway the father of the child cried out to Jesus and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help you my unbelief. I believe, Lord. But the problem is sometimes my faith is weak and I need help from you. Make my faith stronger. Help me when, I, when, I'm, when I'm failing, when, I, when I am stumbling, I need your help. Luke chapter uh, 17 verse 5 and the apostles said to the Lord increase our faith very important to go to God if you have doubts and ask the Lord to make your faith stronger Ephesians chapter um, 3 verses 14 to 19 for this reason says Paul I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with his with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So here, here Paul is telling them, basically, I bow my knees, I pray for you all the time. For what reason? What's the purpose? That you may understand the gospel better, that you may be full with uh, uh, knowledge and assurance of salvation. Then the uh, uh, third means of grace is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, which is um, a memorial that we celebrate. We have it here every month, but it is something that is intended to draw us nearer to God. And the Apostle Paul writes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, saying, The cup of blessing which we bless, it is not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So what he's saying here, it is more than just a, a ceremony that we come here and that we do and that we repeat mindlessly. No, it is a communion with Jesus Christ. It is a special moment in which you get closer to God. And that should have some, should have some effect in your life and, and help you in your assurance of salvation. He also says in chapter 11 verses 26 to 28 for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the lord's death till he come therefore whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the lord worthily shall be guilty of the low blood body and blood of the lord but let a man examine himself so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup he's saying you must examine yourself you must you know Take a time to, to go over your life, your spiritual life, and meditate on it. And, the, you know, the things you have done, if you, if you have sinned, ask God to forgive you. And have this time of communion. Have this time of uh, separation and preparation with God. And when we do that, it help, helps us have a... Uh, assurance of salvation then the uh, last means of grace that i'm going to mention 
this morning is the brotherly fellowship. Fellowship with other Christians. It is very important to be with other people who are like-minded, who are maybe uh, more mature in the faith, who are going to encourage you, who are going to help you in your Christian walk. And the Bible says a lot about that. I'm going to read uh, three passages. Romans 1, 11 to 12. It says, For I long to see you, Paul writing to the Romans, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. He's saying, I, I'm hoping to go there to impart some gift to you, but also that you also, by the mutual communion, that you may impart something to me. Fellowship, we help each other. Galatians 6, verse 2, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 to 15, now we exhort you, brothers, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil to any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourself and to all men. So God, uh, when he saved us, he calls us his sheep, right? Because sheep are meant to be together. You never see a lone ranger sheep, you know, going its own way. That's a stray sheep that has to be brought back to the, to the, to the fold. And he meant the Christian life to be lived in the context of a community where everybody, everyone is helping the other. And, you know, these four means of grace, of course, that's what we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, when, where we read that the, uh, the first disciples, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the word, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So those are the means of grace. Then uh, the confession may, mentions making your calling an election sure, which is a paraphrase from Second Peter. They say, and therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling an election sure. And in Second Peter uh, 1.10, it says, therefore the rather brothers give diligence to make your calling an election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. And, of course, before he mentioned all these things that pertain to life and godliness. And he says, God has given us all those, these things that pertain to life and godliness, but not for you to remain, you know, idle. You know, now you have to add to your faith, what? Hope and to your hope, perseverance and, and all those things. You know, that long chain of things. <clears throat> so making your calling an election sure doesn't mean that uh, they are not a sure thing. No. Uh, or that we make it uh, sure, as if God wasn't, wasn't sure whether he elected you or not. No, it is making your calling an election sure. It's, it's for you, for you to have that certainty of that calling and that election. And how do we do that? Well, by practicing those things that pertain to life and godliness that he mentions in the preceding verses. So they conclude the, uh, the paragraph, paragraph three, by reminding us that assurance will lead people to holiness of life. Assurance of salvation will lead people, will move people to holiness of life rather than to a life of sin, because that was the accusation from the Roman Catholic. That's the reason why they you know, took all that time to come up with this doctrine of the, the assurance, because they believe that if you have assurance of salvation, then if, if anyone has assurance of salvation, that then that is going to move people to live in sin. As if, you know, well, if I am saved and, and there's, uh, uh, I have this assurance that I'm going to be saved, then, you know, it doesn't matter if I sin, then I'm going to live my life in sin and I'm going to uh, be saved at the end. Well, here the authors of the confession say no. That's not, that's not what happens when a person have, has assurance of salvation, a biblical assurance of salvation. It is the opposite. That person is going to be 
live to live his life in more holiness and they say that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the holy spirit in love and thankfulness to god and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience the proper fruits of this assurance obedience to god joy in the holy spirit so far is it from inclining men to lose this that's how they conclude paragraph uh, three <clears throat> So, more quickly, we're going to see paragraph four. Up to now, we have talked about the person who has never had assurance of salvation. Now, <clears throat> what about losing that assurance? What, what if you have that assurance of salvation in your life and then you lose it? And then you start doubting and you lose your assurance. Well, the confession ends the chapter with this subject of losing your assurance. Paragraph 4, <clears throat> true believers may have the assurance of their salvation diverse ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted, as by negligence in preserving of it, by falling into some special sin which woundeth the conscience and grieves the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light, yet are they never destitute of the seed of God and life of faith, that love of Christ <clears throat> and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty, duty, out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, and by the which, in the meantime, they are preserved from utter despair. So, in a nutshell, yes, it is possible for somebody who was certain of his salvation go through these things that they mention here by sin, by temptation, by negligence. Go back, have some uh, a, a regression and start doubting his salvation. <clears throat> and they say, but the seed of God is still there, continues to be there. If that person is a true believer, that seed of God is there. So they mention here, they mention negligence in communion with the Lord, whether in public or in private. Um, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. The reason why the author of Hebrews is saying that is because if you do that, if you forsake the assembling of, of yourselves together, if you forsake, you know, coming to church or to have a fellowship with other Christians, it's going to have an effect in your life. And you may go through that those dark times where you start even doubting about things that you were certain before. You may have doubts because of your negligence to you know, continue in the means of grace. By sin, they say, as in the case of David, how he says in the Psalms, Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, how he felt when he sinned against God and he did not confess his sin. He says, Psalm 32, verses 3 to 4, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old. Through my roaring all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. So he, because of his sin and because he did not confess his sin to the Lord, he felt like the hand of God was heavy on him. What a terrible thing. But later then, what did he do? He confessed his transgression to the Lord. By temptations, when you go through temptations... Many times, believers doubt their salvation and they say, well, if I were a true believer, I wouldn't be having these thoughts in my mind, these horrible thoughts. But everybody goes through temptations. To be tempted is not the same than to sin. If you, if you are tempted and you reject that temptation, you have not sinned against, against God. But temptations, many times, temptations lead believers to, to doubt their salvations. And then they say that sometimes God hides, hides his face for all these reasons. 
you know, it feels like God is not there with us. In Isaiah 8, verse 17, we read, And I will wait on the Lord that hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Sometimes it feels like God isn't there, that his face is not smiling upon us. Then they say, however, believers are never destitute of the seed of God and life of faith. And that seed preserves them uh, <clears throat> in faith and obedience. We read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Why? Because his seed, the seed of God, remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That doesn't mean when he says that I cannot sin, that, you know, sin in general, he's talking about living a life of sin, going back to a life of sin. A person who is a true believer, he may go through very dark times. He may go through uh, at times where, where, where his faith is not as strong, where he is not walking maybe the way he was walking before. But he will never go back. To, he cannot fall from that state of grace because the seed of God is in him and he, God, will bring him back. Then they say that the Lord preserves from total total despair and i'm going to close reading in lamentations there is a very 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 a beautiful passage in the book of lamentations chapter 3 <coughs> verses 21 to 26 this i recall to my mind therefore have i hope it is of the lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not they are new every morning great is your faithfulness the Lord is my portion, said my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good to them that wait for him. The soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And then in verses 31 to 33. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, yet Will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies? For he, <coughs> excuse me, for he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. Yes, you may go through those dark times, but there's God will bring you back and he will make his face to shine upon you once again. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we. <clears throat> come to your holy presence and we thank you Lord thank you for the assurance of salvation and may we have this uh, hope and this confidence when we go through those dark times of sin and temptation and, and depression in our lives that we may remember these words that you are always with us and that we are your children that you love us and we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ Amen <clears throat>